Music Industry, Wikipedia Article Audio The music industry consists of the companies and individuals that earn money by creating new songs and pieces and selling live concerts and shows, audio and video recordings, compositions, and sheet music, and the organizations and associations that aid and represent creators. Among the many individuals and organizations that operate in the industry are, the songwriters and composers who create new songs and musical pieces, the singers, musicians, conductors and band leaders who perform the music, the companies and professionals who create and sell recorded music and slash or sheet music, and those that help organize and present live music performances. History Early History Advent of Recorded Music and Radio Broadcasting Rise of Digital and Online Distribution Business Structure Compositions Recordings Media Broadcast, Soundtrack, and Streaming Live Music Artist Management, Representation, and Staff Emerging Business Models Sales Statistics Digital Album Volume Sales Growth in 2014 Consolidation Album Sales and Market Value Recorded Music Retail Sales 2000 2005 2003 2007 2011 2012 Total Revenue by Year By Region Associations and Organizations Transparency The industry also includes a range of professionals who assist singers and musicians with their music careers, those who broadcast audio or video music content, music journalists and music critics, DJs, music educators and teachers, musical instrument manufacturers, as well as many others. In addition to the businesses and artists who work in the music industry to make a profit or income, there is a range of organizations that also play an important role in the music industry, including musicians' unions, not-for-profit performance rights organizations and other associations. The modern Western music industry emerged between the 1930s and 1950s, when records replaced sheet music as the most important product in the music business. In the commercial world, the recording industry a reference to recording performances of songs and pieces and selling the recordings began to be used as a loose synonym for the music industry. In the 20 hundreds, a majority of the music market is controlled by three major corporate labels, the French-owned Universal Music Group, the Japanese-owned Sony Music Entertainment, and the US-owned Warner Music Group. Labels outside of these three major labels are referred to as independent labels. The largest portion of the live music market for concerts and tours is controlled by Live Nation, the largest promoter and music venue owner. Live Nation is a former subsidiary of Ehart Media Inc., which is the largest owner of radio stations in the United States. In the first decades of the 2000s, the music industry underwent drastic changes with the advent of widespread digital distribution of music via the Internet. A conspicuous indicator of these changes is total music sales. Since 2000, sales of recorded music have dropped off substantially while live music has increased in importance. In 2011, the largest recorded music retailer in the world was now a digital, internet-based platform operated by a computer company, Apple Inc.'s online iTunes store. Printed Music in Europe 
music publishing using machine printed sheet music developed during the Renaissance music era in the mid 15th century. The development of music publication followed the evolution of printing technologies that were first developed for printing regular books. After the mid 15th century, mechanical techniques for printing sheet music were first developed. The earliest example, a set of liturgical chants, dates from about 1465, shortly after the Gutenberg Bible was printed. Prior to this time, music had to be copied out by hand. To copy music notation by hand was a very costly, labor-intensive, and time-consuming process, so it was usually undertaken only by monks and priests seeking to preserve sacred music for the church. The few collections of secular music that are extant were commissioned and owned by wealthy aristocrats. Examples include the Squore Chalupi Codex of Italian Trecento music and the Chantilly Codex of French R. Subtilier music. The use of printing enabled sheet music to reproduce much more quickly and at a much lower cost than hand copying music notation. This helped musical styles to spread to other cities and countries more quickly, and it also enabled music to be spread to more distant areas. Prior to the invention of music printing, a composer's music might only be known in the city she lived in and its surrounding towns, because only wealthy aristocrats would be able to afford to have hand copies made of her music. With music printing, though, a composer's music could be printed and sold at a relatively low cost to purchasers from a wide geographic area. As sheet music of major composers' pieces and songs began to be printed and distributed in a wider area, this enabled composers and listeners to hear new styles and forms of music. A German composer could buy songs written by an Italian or English composer, and an Italian composer could buy pieces written by Dutch composers and learn how they wrote music. This led to more blending of musical styles from different countries and regions. The pioneer of modern music printing was Ottaviano Petrucci, a printer and publisher who was able to secure a 20-year monopoly on printed music in Venice during the 16th century. Venice was one of the major business and music centers during this period. His harmonious music sought hecatone a collection of chansons printed in 1501, is commonly misidentified as the first book of sheet music printed from movable type. Actually that distinction belongs to the Roman printer Ulrich Hans Missale Romanum of 1476. Nevertheless, Petrucci's later work was extraordinary for the complexity of his white men's ural notation and the smallness of his font. He printed the first book of polyphony using movable type. He also published numerous works by the most highly regarded composers of the Renaissance, including Gisquine de Prez and Antoine Brumel. He flourished by focusing on Flemish works, rather than Italian as they were very popular throughout Europe during the Renaissance music era. His printing shop used the triple impression method, in which a sheet of paper was pressed three times. The first impression was the staff lines, the second the words, and the third the notes. This method produced very clean and readable results, although it was time-consuming and expensive. Until the 18th century, the processes of formal composition and of the printing of music took place for the most part with the support of patronage from aristocracies and churches. In the mid to late 18th century, performers and composers such as Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart began to seek more commercial opportunities to market their music and performances to the general public. After Mozart's death, his wife continued the process of commercialization of his music through an unprecedented series of memorial concerts, selling his manuscripts, 
and collaborating with her second husband, George Neeson, on a biography of Mozart. In the 19th century, sheet music publishers dominated the music industry. Prior to the invention of sound recording technologies, the main way for music lovers to hear new symphonies and opera arias was to buy the sheet music and perform the music in a living room, using friends who were amateur musicians and singers. In the United States, the music industry arose in tandem with the rise of blackface minstrelsy. Blackface is a form of theatrical makeup used predominantly by non-black performers to represent a black person. The practice gained popularity during the 19th century and contributed to the spread of negative racial stereotypes of African American people. In the late part of the century the group of music publishers and songwriters which dominated popular music in the United States became known as Tin Pan Alley. The name originally referred to a specific place, West 28th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue in Manhattan, and a plaque on the sidewalk on 28th Street between Broadway and 6th commemorates it. The start of Tin Pan Alley is usually dated to about 1885, when a number of music publishers set up shop in the same district of Manhattan. The end of Tin Pan Alley is less clear-cut. Some date it to the start of the Great Depression in the 1930s when the phonograph and radio supplanted sheet music as the driving force of American popular music, while others consider Tin Pan Alley to have continued into the 1950s when earlier styles of American popular music were upstaged by the rise of rock and roll. At the dawn of the early 20th century, the development of sound recording began to function as a disruptive technology to the commercial interests which published sheet music. During the sheet music era, if a regular person wanted to hear popular new songs, she would buy the sheet music and play it at home on a piano, or learn the song at home while playing the accompaniment part on piano or guitar. Commercially released phonograph records of musical performances, which became available starting in the late 1880s, and later the onset of widespread radio broadcasting, starting in the 1920s, forever changed the way music was heard and listened to. Opera houses, concert halls, and clubs continued to produce music and musicians and singers continued to perform live but the power of radio allowed bands, ensembles, and singers who had previously performed only in one region to become popular on a nationwide and sometimes even a worldwide scale. Moreover, whereas attendance at the top symphony and opera concerts was formerly restricted to high-income people in a pre-radio world, with broadcast radio, a much larger wider range of people, including lower- and middle-income people could hear the best orchestras, big bands, popular singers, and opera shows. The record industry eventually replaced the sheet music publishers as the music industry's largest force. A multitude of record labels came and went. Some noteworthy labels of the earlier decades include the Columbia Records, Crystallate, Decca Records, Edison Bell, The Gramophone Company, Invicta, Calliope, Path, Victor Talking Machine Company and many others. Many record companies died out as quickly as they had formed, and by the end of the 1980s, the Big Six Emmy, CBS, BMG, Polygram, WE, and MCA dominated the industry. Sony bought CBS Records in 1987 and changed its name to Sony Music in 1991. In mid-1998, Polygram Music Group merged with MCA Music Entertainment creating what we now know as Universal Music Group. Since then, Sony and BMG merged in 2004 and Universal took over the majority of Emmy's recorded music interests in 2012. 
Emmy Music Publishing, also once part of the now defunct British conglomerate, is now CO owned by Sony as a subsidiary of Sony slash ATV Music Publishing. Genre wise, music entrepreneurs expanded their industry models into areas like folk music, in which composition and performance had continued for centuries on an ad hoc self supporting basis. Forming an independent record label, or indie label, or signing to such a label continues to be a popular choice for up and coming musicians, especially in genres like hardcore punk and extreme metal despite the fact that indies cannot offer the same financial backing of major labels. Some bands prefer to sign with an indie label, because these labels typically give performers more artistic freedom. In the first decade of the 2000s, digitally downloaded and streamed music became more popular than buying physical recordings. This gave consumers almost frictionless access to a wider variety of music than ever before. At the same time, consumers spent less money on recorded music than they had in the 1990s. Total revenues in the U.S. dropped by half, from a high of $14.6 billion in 1999 to $6.3 billion in 2009, according to Forrester Research. Worldwide revenues for CDs, vinyl, cassettes, and digital downloads fell from $36.9 billion in 2000 to $15.9 billion in 2010 according to IFPI. The Economist and the New York Times report that the downward trend is expected to continue for the foreseeable future. This dramatic decline in revenue has caused large-scale layoffs inside the industry driven retailers out of business and forced record companies, record producers, studios, recording engineers, and musicians to seek new business models. In response to the rise of widespread illegal file sharing of digital music recordings, the record industry took aggressive legal action. In 2001 it succeeded in shutting down the popular music website Napster and threatened legal action against thousands of individuals who participated in sharing music song sound files. However, this failed to slow the decline in music recording revenue and proved to be a public relations disaster for the music industry. Some academic studies have even suggested that downloads did not cause the decline in sales of recordings. The 2008 British Music Rights Survey showed that 80% of people in Britain wanted a legal peer-to-peer file-sharing service, however only half of the respondents thought that the music's creators should be paid. The survey was consistent with the results of earlier research conducted in the United States, upon which the open music model was based. Legal digital downloads became widely available with the debut of the Apple iTunes Store in 2003. The popularity of Internet music distribution has increased and by 2012 digital music sales topped physical sales of music. Atlantic Records reports that digital sales have surpassed physical sales. However, as The Economist reports, Paid digital downloads grew rapidly, but did not begin to make up for the loss of revenue from CDs. After 2010, Internet-based services such as Deezer, Pandora, Spotify, and Apple's iTunes Radio began to offer subscription-based pay-to-stream services over the Internet. With streaming services, the user pays a subscription to a company for the right to listen to songs and other media from a library. Whereas with legal digital download services, the purchaser owns a digital copy of the song, with streaming services, the user never downloads the song file or owns the song file. The subscriber can only listen to the song for as long as they continue to pay the streaming subscription. Once the user stops paying the subscription, 
they cannot listen to the company's songs anymore. Streaming services began to have a serious impact on the industry in 2014. Spotify, together with the music streaming industry in general, faces some criticism from artists claiming they are not being fairly compensated for their work as downloaded music sales decline and music streaming increases. Unlike physical or download sales, which pay a fixed price per song or album, Spotify pays artists based on their market share. They distribute approximately 70% to rights holders, who will then pay artists based on their individual agreements. The variable, and some say inadequate, nature of this compensation, has led to criticism. Spotify reports paying on average 0.006 US dollars to 0.008 US dollars per stream. In response, Spotify claims that they are benefiting the music business by migrating them away from piracy and less monetized platforms and allowing them to generate far greater royalties than before by encouraging users to use their paid service. The Recording Industry Association of America revealed through its 2015 earnings report that streaming services were responsible for 34.3% of the year's total industry revenue, growing 29% from the previous year and becoming the largest source of income, pulling in around $2.4 billion. U.S. streaming revenue grew 57% to $1.6 billion in the first half of 2016 and accounted for almost half of industry sales. This is in stark contrast to the $14.6 billion in revenue that was received in 1999 by the music industry from the sale of CDs. The turmoil in the recorded music industry in the 2000s altered the 20th century balance between artists, record companies, promoters, retail music stores, and the consumer. As of 2010, big box stores such as Walmart and Best Buy sell more records than music-only CD stores, which have ceased to function as a major player in the music industry. Recording artists now rely on live performance and merchandise sales for the majority of their income, which in turn has made them more dependent on music promoters like Live Nation. In order to benefit from all of an artist's income streams, record companies increasingly rely on the 360 deal, a new business relationship pioneered by Robbie Williams and Emmy in 2007. At the other extreme, record companies can offer a simple manufacturing and distribution deal, which gives a higher percentage to the artist, but does not cover the expenses of marketing and promotion. Companies like Kickstarter help independent musicians produce their albums through fans funding bands they want to listen to. Many newer artists no longer see a record deal as an integral part of their business plan at all. Inexpensive recording hardware and software made it possible to record reasonable quality music on a laptop in a bedroom and distribute it over the Internet to a worldwide audience. This, in turn, caused problems for recording studios, record producers, and audio engineers. The Los Angeles Times reports that as many as half of the recording facilities in that city have failed. Changes in the music industry have given consumers access to a wider variety of music than ever before, at a price that gradually approaches zero. However, consumer spending on music-related software and hardware increased dramatically over the last decade providing a valuable new income stream for technology companies such as Apple Inc. and Pandora Radio. The music industry is a complex system of many different organizations, firms and individuals. It has undergone dramatic changes in the first decades of the 21st century. However, the majority of the participants in the music industry still fulfill their traditional roles, 
which are described below. There are three types of property that are created and sold by the recording industry, compositions, recordings, and media. There may be many recordings of a single composition and a single recording will typically be distributed via many media. For example, the song My Way is owned by its composers, Paul Anka and Claude Francois. Frank Sinatra's recording of My Way is owned by Capitol Records. Sid Vicious's recording of My Way is owned by Virgin Records, and the millions of CDs and vinyl records that contain these recordings are owned by millions of individual consumers. Songs, instrumental pieces, and other musical compositions are created by songwriters or composers and are originally owned by the composer, although they may be sold or the rights may be otherwise assigned. For example, in the case of work for hire, the composition is owned immediately by another party. Traditionally, the copyright owner licenses or assigns some of their rights to publishing companies, by means of a publishing contract. The publishing company collects fees when the composition is used. A portion of the royalties are paid by the publishing company to the copyright owner depending on the terms of the contract. Sheet music provides an income stream that is paid exclusively to the composers and their publishing company. Typically, the publishing company will provide the owner with an advance against future earnings when the publishing contract is signed. A publishing company will also promote the compositions, such as by acquiring song placements on television or in films. Recordings are created by recording artists, which includes singers, musicians, and musical ensembles usually with the assistance and guidance from record producers and audio engineers. They were traditionally made in recording studios in a recording session. In the 21st century, advances in digital recording technology have allowed many producers and artists to create home studios using high-end computers and digital recording programs like Protoalls, bypassing the traditional role of the official recording studio. The record producer oversees all aspects of the recording, making many of the logistic, financial, and artistic decisions in cooperation with the artists. The record producer has a range of different responsibilities including choosing material and slash or working with the composers, hiring session musicians, helping to arrange the songs, overseeing the musician performances, and directing the audio engineer during recording and mixing to get the best sound. Audio engineers are responsible for ensuring good audio quality during the recording. They select and set up microphones and use effects units and mixing consoles to adjust the sound and level of the music. A recording session may also require the services of an arranger, orchestrator, studio musicians, session musicians, vocal coaches, or even a discreetly hired ghostwriter to help with the lyrics or songwriter. Recordings are owned by record companies. Some artists own their own record companies. A recording contract specifies the business relationship between a recording artist and the record company. In a traditional contract, the company provides an advance to the artist who agrees to record music that will be owned by the company. The A&R department of a record company is responsible for finding new talent and overseeing the recording process. The company pays for the recording costs and the cost of promoting and marketing the record. For physical media, the company also pays to manufacture and distribute the physical recordings. Smaller record companies will form business relationships with other companies to handle many of these tasks. The record company pays the recording artist a portion of the income from the sale of the recordings also known as a royalty, but this is distinct from the publishing royalties described above. This portion is similar to a percentage, 
but may be limited or expanded by a number of factors that are specified by the record contract. Session musicians and orchestra members are under contract to provide work for hire, they are typically only paid one-time fees or regular wages for their services, rather than ongoing royalties. Physical media are sold by music retailers and are owned by the consumers after they buy them. Buyers do not typically have the right to make digital copies from CDs or other media they buy, or rent or lease the CDs, because they do not own the recording on the CD, they only own the individual physical CD. A music distributor delivers crates of the packaged physical media from the manufacturer to the retailer and maintains commercial relationships with retailers and record companies. The music retailer pays the distributor, who in turn pays the record company for the recordings. The record company pays mechanical royalties to the publisher and composer via a collection society. The record company then pays royalties, if contractually obligated, to the recording artist. In the case of digital downloads or online streaming of music, there is no physical media other than the consumer's computer memory on her portable media player or laptop. For this reason, artists such as Taylor Swift, Paul McCartney, Kings of Leon, and others have called for legal changes that would deny social media the right to stream their music without paying them royalties. In the digital and online music market of the 2000s, the distributor becomes optional. Large online shops may pay the labels directly, but digital distributors do exist to provide distribution services for vendors large and small. When purchasing digital downloads or listening to music streaming, the consumer may be required to agree to record company and vendor licensing terms beyond those which are inherent in copyright, for example, some services may allow consumers to freely share the recording, but others may restrict the user to storing the music on a specific number of hard drives or devices. When a recording is broadcast, performance rights organizations collect a third type of royalty known as a performance royalty, which is paid to songwriters, composers, and recording artists. This royalty is typically much smaller than publishing or mechanical royalties. Within the past decade, more than 15 to 30 percent of tracks on streaming services are unidentified with a specific artist. Jeff Price says Audium, an online music streaming service, has made over several hundred thousand dollars in the past year from collecting royalties from online streaming. According to Ken Levitin, manager from Kings of Leon, Cheap Trick, and others, YouTube has become radio for kids. Because of the overuse of YouTube and offline streaming, album sales have fallen by 60% in the past few years. When recordings are used in television and film, the composer and their publishing company are typically paid through a synchronization license. In the 2000s, online subscription services also provide an income stream directly to record companies, and through them, to artists, contracts permitting. A promoter brings together a performing artist and a venue owner and arranges contracts. A booking agency represents the artist to promoters, makes deals, and books performances. Consumers usually buy tickets either from the venue or from a ticket distribution service such as Ticketmaster. In the US, Live Nation is the dominant company in all of these roles, they own most of the large venues in the US, they are the largest promoter, and they own Ticketmaster. Choices about where and when to tour are decided by the artist's management and the artist sometimes in consultation with the record company. Record companies may finance a tour in the hopes that it will help promote the sale of recordings. However, in the 21st century, 
it has become more common to release recordings to promote ticket sales for live shows, rather than book tours to promote the sales of recordings. Major, successful artists will usually employ a road crew, a semi-permanent touring organization that travels with the artist during concert series. The road crew is headed by a tour manager. Crew members provide stage lighting, live sound reinforcement, musical instrument tuning and maintenance, bodyguard for the artist and transportation of the equipment and music ensemble members. On large tours, the road crew may also include an accountant, stage manager, hairdressers, makeup artists, and catering staff. Local crews are typically hired to help move equipment on and off stage. On a small tour with less financial backing, all of these jobs may be handled by just a few roadies or by the musicians themselves. Bands signed with small indie labels and bands in genres such as hardcore punk are more likely to do tours without a road crew, or with minimal support. Universal Music Group 28.8%, Independent Labels 22.6%, Sony Music Entertainment 21.1%, ME 14.1%, Warner Music Group 13.4%. Independent Labels 28.3%, Universal Music Group 25.5%, Sony BMG Music Entertainment 21.5%, EMI Group 13.4%, Warner Music Group 11.3%. Universal Music Group 29.85%, Sony Music Entertainment 29.29%, Warner Music Group 19.13%, Independent Labels 12.11%, EMI Group, 9.62% Universal Music Group which owns EMI Music 32.41% plus 6.78% of EMI Group, Sony Music Entertainment which owns publishing arm of EMI Group 30.25%, Warner Music Group 19.15%, Independent Labels 11.42%. Artists such as singers and musicians may hire a number of people from other fields to assist them with their career. The artist manager oversees all aspects of an artist's career in exchange for a percentage of the artist's income. An entertainment lawyer assists them with the details of their contracts with record companies and other deals. A business manager handles financial transactions, taxes, and bookkeeping. Unions, such as AFTRA and the American Federation of Musicians in the U.S. provide health insurance and instrument insurance for musicians. A successful artist functions in the market as a brand and, as such, she may derive income from many other streams, such as merchandise, personal endorsements, appearances at events or Internet-based services. These are typically overseen by the artist's manager and take the form of relationships between the artist and companies that specialize in these products. Singers may also hire a vocal coach, dance instructor, or acting coach. Performers may also hire a personal trainer or a life coach to help them. In the 20 hundreds, Traditional lines that once divided singers, instrumentalists, publishers, record companies, distributors, retail, and consumer electronics have become blurred or erased. Artists may record in a home studio using a high-end laptop and a digital recording program such as ProtoAls or use Kickstarter to raise money for an expensive studio recording session without involving a record company. Artists may choose to exclusively promote and market themselves using only free online video sharing services such as YouTube or using social media websites, bypassing traditional promotion and marketing by a record company. 
In the 2000s, consumer electronics and computer companies such as Apple Computer have become digital music retailers. New digital music distribution technologies and the trends towards using sampling of older songs in new songs or blending different songs to create mashup recordings have also forced both governments and the music industry to re examine the definitions of intellectual property and the rights of all the parties involved. Also compounding the issue of defining copyright boundaries is the fact that the definition of royalty and copyright varies from country to country and region to region, which changes the terms of some of these business relationships. According to IFPI, the global digital album sales grew by 6.9% in 2014. Source, Nielsen SoundScan Official Charts Company slash BPI, GFK, and IFPI Estimate World Music Market Sales Shares, According to IFPI Prior to December 1998, the industry was dominated by the Big Six, Sony Music and BMG had not yet merged, and Polygram had not yet been absorbed into Universal Music Group. After the Polygram Universal merger, the 1998 market shares reflected a big five, commanding 77.4% of the market, as follows, according to May World Report 2000. In 2004, the joint venture of Sony and BMG created the big four at a time the global market was estimated at $30.40 billion. Total annual unit sales in 2004 were 3 billion. Additionally, according to an IFPI report published in August 2005, the Big Four accounted for 71.7% .7 of retail music sales. U.S. Music Market Shares, according to Nielsen SoundScan Nielsen SoundScan in their 2011 report noted that the Big Four controlled about 88% of the market. After the absorption of Emmy by Sony Music Entertainment and Universal Music Group in December 2011 the Big Three were created and on January 8, 2013 after the merger there were layoffs of 40 workers from Emmy. European regulators forced Universal Music to spin off ME assets which became the Parlo Phone label group which was acquired by Warner Music Group. Nielsen Soundscan issued a report in 2012, noting that these labels controlled 88.5% of the market, and further noted. Note, the IFPI and Nielsen Soundscan use different methodologies which makes their figures difficult to compare casually, and impossible to compare scientifically. Total album sales have declined in the early decades of the 21st century, leading some music critics to declare the death of the album. The following table shows album sales and market value in the world in 2014. Source IFPI 2014 Annual Report In its June 30, 2000 Annual Report filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, Seagram reported that Universal Music Group made 40% of the worldwide classical music sales over the preceding year. Interim Physical Retail Sales in 2005 All Figures in Millions Approximately 21% of the gross CD revenue numbers in 2003 can be attributed to used CD sales. This number grew to approximately 27% in 2007. The growth is attributed to increasing online sales of used product by outlets such as Amazon.com. The growth of used music media is expected to continue to grow as the cost of digital downloads continues to rise. The sale of used goods financially benefits the vendors and online marketplaces, but in the United States, 
the first sale doctrine prevents copyright owners from double dipping through a levy on the sale of used music. In mid 2011, the RIAA trumpeted a sales increase of 5% over 2010, stating that there's probably no one single reason for the bump. The Nielsen Company and Billboard's 2012 industry report shows overall music sales increased 3.1% over 2011. Digital sales caused this increase, with the digital album sales growth of 14.1% and digital track sales growth of 5.1%, whereas physical music sales decreased by 12.8% versus 2011. Despite the decrease, physical albums were still the dominant album format. Vinyl record sales increased by 17.7% and holiday season album sales decreased by 7,1%. Global Trade Revenue According to the IFPI In the 15 or so years of the Internet economy, the digital music industry has come a long way but there are still major hurdles to cross. Platforms like iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play are major improvements over the early illegal file sharing days, but the multitude of service offerings and revenue models make it difficult to understand the true value of each and what they can deliver for musicians and music companies. These difficulties are further compounded by the fact that, According to a new study from the Berklee College of Music and its Rethink Music initiative, there are major transparency problems throughout the music industry caused by outdated technology. With the emerging of new business models as streaming platforms, and online music services, a large amount of data is processed. Access to big data may increase transparency in the industry.